good morning ladies and gentlemen uh, let me welcome you to our first meeting after the monetary policy session of the bank board uh, i'm very pleased to welcome uh, mr vladimir tomšík vice governor of the czech national bank and Tomáš Holub, uh, head of uh, monetary section, who is after a while uh, going to make presentation. So, we can start, I guess. Please, Tomáš, uh, you can tell us everything about our new inflation report. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I have to apologize in advance because I have a cold, so I cannot speak very well. Instead of my otherwise beautiful melodic voice, uh, you will today hear these uh, uh, disgusting sounds. So I'm, I'm sorry for that, but uh, I will try to be brief. Uh, as usual, I will introduce our new forecast uh, starting uh, with its assumptions and uh, then I'll for concentrate on the forecast itself and uh, in the end I will compare it uh, with the previous one. So speaking about external assumptions, uh, foreign GDP growth and effective euro area has been slowing down and uh, the consensus expect that uh, this trend will continue uh, at the beginning of uh, this year, but then we'll see some re-acceleration towards uh, 2%. Uh, a very important change compared to the recent years is the PPI development. Uh, we are now basically getting to a situation in which uh, PPI, PPI started to grow in the euro area in year-on-year year year terms after so many years of a deep decline and the assumption of uh, the forecast is that uh, the PPI growth uh, will speed up slight, to, to slightly more than uh, 2% uh, in annual terms. Uh, on the other hand, uh, monetary policy in the euro area remains uh, very accommodative which is reflected in the uh, three months uh, Euribor outlook, uh, which is still negative uh, for the whole forecast horizon and in a further depreciation of uh, Euro against the US dollar. Speaking about fiscal policy, uh, based on the cash uh, data outcomes of the state budget, and some other parts of public finance, we estimate that the general government uh, budget was in a slight surplus uh, last year, and uh, this uh, surplus will continue to increase. Uh, of course, partly due to the ongoing economic growth, but uh, uh, mainly uh, due to improving uh, structural balance. Uh, Government consumption increased by slightly more than 2% last year. Uh, we expect that it will continue to grow in, in real terms uh, at slightly or just marginally below 2%. At the same time, I should stress that in nominal terms, uh, government consumption will be growing relatively fast because of uh, increases in wages in the government sector. And speaking about the overall fiscal impact on the economy, the so-called fiscal impulse, uh, after significantly restrictive impulse last year related to the EU fund cycle, uh, we expect a slightly positive contribution to economic growth uh, at 0.3% uh, uh, this year. Uh, related to renewal of growth of uh, government investment co-financed uh, by EU money and a broadly neutral fiscal impact in 2018. As regards uh, monetary policy, the forecast assumes uh, market interest rates remaining flat at uh, the currently 
exceptional low levels and the exchange rate being used as a instrument uh, as an instrument of monetary policy until mid 2017 because uh, around the middle of uh, of uh, mid 2017 uh, there should be uh, sustainable uh, or conditions for a sustainable fulfillment of the 2% inflation target in the future. So even after the return to conventional monetary policy. After the exit from the exchange rate commitment, the forecast is consistent with an increase in market interest rates and uh, some appreciation of corona against the euro. Uh, which, uh, according to the uh, model mechanisms, will be supported by a positive interest rate differential uh, of uh, Czech Koruna against the Euro. Uh, the effect of the ECB's uh, quantitative easing, which we are still reflecting in our forecast through the shadow interest rate concept, and renewed uh, real convergence of the Czech, on, Czech economy to the advanced Euro area countries, uh, which we assume to be much slower than in the pre-crisis period. Uh, in particular, to remind you, our forecasts assume that the equilibrium real exchange rate appreciation is 1.5% uh, a year. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we should acknowledge very strongly that uh, the forecast uh, does not take into account uh, some factors which may be very important or I would say even crucial in the post-exit period such as the counterparty or overbought uh, market situation and of course the forecast also does not take into account possible CNB's interventions in the FX market to mitigate Exchange, sharp exchange rate swings uh, after the exit. Now I go to the forecast itself. Uh, uh, I assume that uh, all of you uh, know that uh, at the very end of uh, last year, uh, inflation uh, got back to the 2% CNB target after four years of uh, very low inflation. And our forecast uh, suggests that uh, inflation will increase further into the upper half of the tolerance band around the CNB target, and then it will converge uh, above back to the 2% target, including the monetary policy horizon, which for the time being is the first half of uh, 2018. Uh, the growth in prices will be fostered by uh, ongoing growth of domestic economy and wages and renewed growth of uh, foreign producer prices in the euro area, which I have uh, already mentioned. On the other hand, uh, after the as assumed exit uh, uh, from the exchange rate commitment, there will be some downward impact on prices from the exchange rate appreciation, which is uh, included in the forecast. Uh, as regards the real economy, uh, the main supportive factor will be renewed growth in government investment co-financed by EU funds and some uh, re-acceleration of Czech exports uh, from quite subdued uh, growth rates uh, at uh, the end of 2016. And uh, another supportive factor will be continued steady growth, growth of uh, household consumption. As regards monetary conditions, uh, we assess them as uh, rather easy, rather accommodative at the, at the moment, and they will remain probably easy, but uh, with the exit uh, from the exchange rate commitment, they will start to shift towards a neutral effect. Let me go into detail. This is uh, the fan chart of uh, our headline inflation forecast. So here you can see that after hitting the 2% inflation target in December last year, we expect a further increase uh, in inflation more or less in the coming two or three quarters. 
and then a gradual return uh, back to the 2% target from above. And the same is true also for our forecast of monetary policy relevant inflation because the impact of indirect exchanges is uh, only small in the current forecast. As regards the structure of already observed increase in inflation, uh, on the left hand chart you can clearly see that uh, the main contribution to this uh, relatively pronounced increase in inflation was due to acceleration in food prices, which was sharper and faster, and it came sooner than we expected in the previous forecast. Uh, pretty much in line with our previous expectations, uh, the, the previous uh, long-lasting decline in fuel prices has faded away. And in December, uh, fuel prices started uh, to grow in year-on-year -year terms. And at the same time, there was an acceleration in uh, our core inflation uh, measure in the red bars. And on the right-hand chart, you can see that uh, the acceleration in core inflation was uh, driven by uh, prices of non-tradables, which is we assess this as partly fundamental and partly related to one-offs. Uh, you know that for quite some time we were expecting that uh, the growing domestic economy and uh, growing wages will lead to an increase or a strengthening of the balasa samuelson effect and that the growing unit labor cost should lead uh, to faster growth in non-tradable prices. But at the same time, speaking specifically about uh, December, there was also an impact uh, of a jump in restaurant prices uh, linked uh, with the introduction of electronic sales registration. And this is to some extent a one-off uh, event which will most probably persist uh, in core inflation in the coming year, but uh, does not in itself signal any uh, durable pressures on prices uh, in this uh, core segment. Uh, going more into the detail of the forecast, uh, administered prices will be declining at the beginning of this year because of uh, a further decline in natural gas prices for households and uh, relatively subdued uh, development of electricity prices. Uh, but uh, for the year as a whole, uh, we expect administered prices to be flat or to marginally increase. And then with the fading of the decline in natural gas prices, uh, we expect that uh, administered prices will grow uh, by 1.3% uh, on average in 2018. Uh, at the same time, uh, at the beginning of, the, of this year, there will be a rather strong base effect in the area of fuel prices. Uh, so their growth uh, will accelerate further uh, in the first quarter of this year, maybe in the, uh, remain quite high in the second quarter, but then it should, of course, uh, start to uh, speed down as the base effect uh, become uh, less supportive. Uh, as regards core inflation, uh, we expect a further acceleration and a peak uh, at around 2.3% uh, annual, annually at the end of uh, 2017, uh, owing to continued uh, cost pressures from the domestic economy coupled with renewed growth of uh, producer prices in the euro area. But later on, during 2019, there will be some slowdown, some decline in core inflation uh, related to the assumed exit uh, from the exchange rate uh, commitment and the associated assumed appreciation of uh, Karuna. The profile is uh, relatively similar also for food price forecast. Uh, again, we expect some 
further acceleration at the beginning of this year, which is already signaled by leading indicators of uh, food price growth for January. But then broadly from the second half of 2017, there will be a slowdown. Again, the assumed appreciation of Corona plays a role in that slowdown. And besides that, there will be also a base effect once the currently observed fast growth of food prices starts to fade out. <clears throat> Speaking about the fundamental factors of inflation, uh, we can see that uh, the domestic economy continues to generate some upward cost pressures and according to our forecast, uh, these, these will peak uh, at the beginning of 2017 when a relatively strong uh, nominal wage growth will be accompanied by currently relatively subdued growth of uh, product, labor productivity. And at the same time, you can see that according to our assessment, the previous deep and long-lasting anti-inflationary effect of import prices has already faded out and uh, import prices may contribute marginally positively to uh, increases in, in costs and consumer prices in the first half of this year. Uh, later on, the overall growth of costs will be uh, reduced uh, by the appreciation of corona after the exit and uh, acceleration, assumed acceleration in productivity growth. Uh, this is our uh, GDP growth forecast, which suggests that uh, the, the deceleration observed in the third quarter of last year was a through in the slowdown and uh, there will be some tendency of Czech economy to re-accelerate not too much. Our forecast for 2017 as well as for 2018, it's 2.8%. Uh, uh, so slightly higher than the expected uh, outcome for 2016, but uh, just by a few tenths of a percentage point. On the positive side, I, as I mentioned, the, the main support will come from uh, renewed growth of uh, government investment but uh, there will be also some adverse effect of slower growth in external demand in the first half of this year and from the second half of 2017 also the shift of monetary policy from uh, quite easy to more neutral. Uh, these are the, the components of aggregate demand so you can see that we expect uh, a rather robust growth of household consumption uh, at around 3% in year-on-year -year terms or even slightly more. We expect a recovery in total investment related to the EU fund cycle and we also expect uh, re-acceleration of uh, export as well as import growth from currently very subdued uh, pace uh, to more than 5% on average, both in 2017 and uh, 2018. Actually, the very subdued export growth uh, in the second half of 2016 was one of the major issues for us when uh, preparing this new forecast because the deceleration in exports was more pronounced than the slowdown in our measure of uh, foreign effective demand. And it was also partly at odds uh, with uh, quite positive leading, and leading indicators coming from the Euro area. So my colleague uh, Mario Vosar from uh, our macroeconomic forecasting division uh, digged uh, deep into the data of uh, exports and production and we, we will have a box on this uh, in our forthcoming inflation report. Basically, he concluded that uh, the slowdown was to a large extent related to developments in the automobile sector, which is a bit paradoxical because at the same time, Czech newspapers were crowded about 
uh, with articles about uh, Autoland, Czech Autoland, impressive production of, uh, uh, of cars, but our conclusion is basically that uh, though that positive picture is a little bit distorted by very good outcomes of Škoda, which continued to do quite well, but the sector as a whole uh, slowed down in the second half uh, of the year compared to a very impressive first half of the year. And while in the first half of the year its growth was so strong that there was no problem for it to offset uh, declining production of exports in chemicals, fuels, electricity, etc. In the second half of the year, the, the growth was uh, simply not sufficient to offset those adverse trends in other sectors to such, such a visible extent. And also, <clears throat> Besides, uh, besides uh, a difference between individual car makers as regards their performance, there is also a difference between car makers and suppliers of components to, uh, to cars uh, produced in Western Europe. Uh, so the car makers on average did better than the suppliers. So this is probably the main reason of uh, slow exports uh, in the, mainly in uh, September and October last year, but uh, we expect that this was to, to some extent uh, temporary and uh, export growth will re-accelerate uh, going forward. Speaking about the labor market, uh, the forecast expect uh, a slowdown in employment growth, uh, both converted in full-time equivalent and non-converted, uh, simply because of the already quite tight labor market conditions and uh, an increasing barrier in terms of shortage of available labor force. And on the other hand, uh, this will create favorable conditions uh, for a further acceleration in nominal wage growth in the private sector, which we expect uh, to exceed uh, 5% uh, during 2017 and uh, 2018, but only, only to a marginal extent above uh, 5%. And unemployment rate will continue to decline, but at a slower pace uh, compared to uh, the previous period. Finally, as I mentioned uh, already at the beginning of the presentation when I was describing the monetary policy assumptions of the forecast, we expect uh, market interest rates to remain at their current low level until mid-2017 and then after the exit, uh, the forecast is consistent with uh, an increase uh, of interest rates in the second half of 2017 and a further modest or more gradual rise in 2018. And here I should once again add the disclaimer that in this interest rate pass, uh, we don't include any technical considerations uh, related to the proper sequencing of uh, monetary policy steps associated with the exit from our exchange rate commitment. Uh, finally, I'm sorry, finally, a brief comparison with the previous forecast. Uh, the changes are not that big except for the inflation forecast, but mainly at the short end, because uh, actual inflation at the end of 2016 uh, surprised us uh, on the upside. As I mentioned, there are relatively strong leading indicators of food price growth for January this year. So putting all this together, we shifted up our uh, he headline inflation forecast in 2017 but then the change in 2018 is actually quite negligible. And overall, we, we actually don't have big changes uh, in the forecast of other key variables. GDP growth is a little bit slower for 2017 and 2018 as a whole, but 
the change is uh, only small. On the other hand, we have a slightly higher forecast for nominal wages. And another, another change which may be worth mentioning, it's the slower pace of increases in our market interest rates after the assumed exit. And, and here, the main driving factor is the prolonged QE by the European Central Bank, which, as I mentioned, is including is included into the forecast via the shadow interest rate concept. And, and those shadow interest rates now remain significantly negative for longer than in the previous forecast. So this is the upward shift in the headline inflation. You can see that there was already a big uh, upward surprise in the uh, fourth quarter of 2016, which will increase a little bit further at the beginning of this year but more or less after one year, those upward surprises will largely fade out and we return to a similar trajectory of inflation. Uh, going into the depths of or decomposition of the inflation forecast, we have higher outlook for market prices, the so-called uh, net inflation measure, which is partly uh, offset by more subdued uh, prediction of uh, administered prices related to a further decline in uh, natural gas prices uh, and uh, a less pronounced increase in electricity prices than what we expected uh, in the previous forecast. Uh, as regards the market prices or net inflation, we have an upward revision for the next a few quarters, both as regards food price growth and uh, core inflation, because both of these two uh, subcategories of the basket uh, surprised us to the upside at the, at the end of uh, last year. Uh, sorry, uh, this is the GDP forecast. So we start from a lower pace uh, associated uh, with the weaker than expected uh, growth of uh, exports and a less positive uh, contribution of net exports to growth in the uh, third quarter of 2016. But then the two trajectories like hover around uh, each other and uh, on balance, uh, if, if you look at the average growth rates for 2017 and 2018, uh, they are very very close uh, to each other and uh, the new forecast is only slightly below the previous one. Uh, we have basically an unchanged uh, forecast for household consumption. Uh, we are a little bit uh, more optimistic about investment growth and uh, related to the observed slowdown uh, less optimistic in the near term about export and import growth, but uh, looking, looking at the medium term horizon, as I mentioned, we expect re-acceleration of foreign trade and, and then the growth rates are actually uh, relatively similar. This chart shows a somewhat uh, faster uh, nominal, nominal wage growth, uh, related to the upward surprises and some data revisions in 2016. And going forward, it also uh, reflects the observed as well as predicted uh, higher inflation. And finally, here we have the less steep increase in interest rates, which as I mentioned, it's associated with the ex extension of the ECB's asset purchases, even though this extension is at a smaller volume of uh, monthly purchases. And that's it. Uh, once again, I apologize for my voice and uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Tomas. Uh, before we start with the questions, I have only technical information for our guests in a second row on my, on my left side. Please, if you will ask some question, please use the mics on the first row. Thank you very much. And of course, please tell us before your name and company you are for. So now we can, we can start with the questions. 
So, good morning, everybody, once more. I'm very pleased that I mean, the, the room is really full of you. So, and I think it's always very, very useful to take like one or two free questions in one round, and I will try to answer all of them. Maybe I can just combine together, we will see. So, who wants to start? Please. Uh, good morning, Victor Seisler, Commercial Banker. Uh, I have two questions. My on Vice Governor Tom Sheik. Um, could you imagine that we are sitting here like in three months on, on May 4th. Uh, the forecast is showing uh, the inflation sustainably above the growth. We have the current inflation above, uh, above uh, the target and, uh, and you, you would tell us that the, that the FX commitment continues. Um, and one on Tomáš Holub. Um, the forecast suggests that the, the, the conditions for, for scrapping the floor will be around the mid-2017. Um, what do we lack now in the forecast so that the, so that the conditions are not fulfilled and what will be different in mid-2017 uh, with regard to the forecast? Thank you. Thank you. So we got two questions. Do we have some more? Let me just take one or two more questions. Yeah, Michal. Uh, thank you, Michal Skořepa, Česká spořitelná. Uh, my question concerns uh, the potential implicit pro-inflationary risk, which might be hidden in the forecast, given that in all likelihood, after the exit uh, is, uh, after the Czech National Bank exits from, from the floor, there will probably be some waiting time before uh, actually you start increasing the interest rates. So maybe the, the forecast for interest rates uh, is not completely realistic. So whether it's still true, whether you would say that it's still true that there is a certain kind of pro-inflationary risk uh, in the forecast due to this factor. Thank you. Right, so we have a question regarding pro-inflationary risk regarding the forecast and one more question in the first round. If we do have, yeah, Jakub. Jakub Seiler, ING Bank. Uh, I will a little bit follow the question of uh, Michal Skořepa. Uh, do you have some border of the exchange rate if the corona would be weakening after the exit due to the uh, closing the position because the you know, weaker exchange rate would be complicated, uh, also the inflationary path and would be also quite a pro inflationary factor. So uh, I would like to ask whether you elaborated some level which may be uh, for the CNB uh, starting point for intervention to do uh, Corona a little bit stronger. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we got like three, four questions. And I will try to answer all of them, but I think it's always, I mean, useful to try to introduce some, I mean, the, lo the, the way how we think and how we look at our current economic environment, especially for the forecast. So the first question was about the situation in May 4 and about the current inflation, I mean, above the inflation target and what will we say regarding our FX commitment, our future using monetary policy. First of all, I, I, if I understood correctly, I heard there was a question regarding the current inflation. And it seems to me, this is the exactly case that we can look at our forecast right now. And Mr. Holub, he clearly said that, well, the inflation for this year, 2017, it seems to us it's definitely, it's going to be above inflation target. But we are not able to influence this current inflation. We are always aiming at the inflation in next 12, 18, mean, monetary policy horizon. So definitely, and I think, I mean, there is nothing that we can do with the current inflation, and it's very difficult to really influence the inflation in a short horizon. So back to your question, <coughs> if there is a May 4th, and I see that the current inflation is definitely above the inflation target, I mean, for me, it's very important to look at the, I mean, forecasted inflation. So even if there is a May 4th, I will look at the forecasted inflation May for 2018, yeah? So, and th that's why, I mean, I, I read a lot of, I mean, comments coming from you, from analysts in December, in January, that the current inflation or the inflation, I mean, reported from the, the fourth quarter 2016 reached 2%. It's the right time to think about, I mean, exiting FX floor, exiting, our, I mean, our commercial monetary policy. But again, 
It's past inflation. There is nothing we can do. We, and we, when we embark on using a fixed, I mean, commitment, it was in November 2013, we clearly stated that, well, once we are thinking about the exit, we want to see sustainable inflation for the future. So again, there is nothing, I mean, that we look at the current inflation. We always have to look at the future inflation. So that will, that will be my answer to your questions. Regarding the second questions, if we see some pro-inflationary risk. If I look at the presentations delivered by our government yesterday, it's clearly stated that the bank board assessed the risk to the forecast as being balanced, yeah. But of course, I mean, there is always some, there can be some pro-inflation as well as, well as anti-inflationary, I mean, risk. Regarding pro-inflationary, probably Tomáš, he will be the better person to answer that, but I can confirm there were some discussions regarding the current risk yesterday when we had meeting, yeah? But I, now I clearly recall in my memory that yesterday there was a discussion even anti-inflationary risk. And one of the anti-inflationary risks is as follow. We clearly see an increase in productivity in the, sec I mean in the, in the economy, yeah? And it's anti-inflationary, I mean, um, a risk. And another risk is as follow, that I mean, if we, start thinking about exiting FX floor, the assumptions of the forecast is that, well, probably the exchange rate can appreciate due to increasing interest rates. That's the assumption of the forecast. Once we increase interest rates, there will be an increase in interest rate differential. And again, it's anti, why? And why I'm saying that because, I mean, we always have to look at some, I would say, disposable incomes of the households. And if we start increasing interest rates, a lot of households, they have debts. They have a huge mortgage means. Once we start increasing I mean, interest rates, probably it can affect data, I mean, disposable incomes. It's another anti-inflationary risk. On the other hand, there can be some inflationary risk because, well, maybe it's in line with our forecast, and you, you saw that, that we forecast regarding the growth of wages around 5%. Yeah? So, there are some anti-inflationary as well as pro-inflationaries, but I mean, totally they are balanced. And I think I will pass the floor too much maybe to, to, to address the risk regarding the forecast a little bit more. Okay, I will try to answer those questions. So the, the first question from Victor, I interpreted as asking why do you assess the conditions for sustainable target fulfillment being met in mid-2017 and not before it, because the forecast is uh, above target? Yeah, but uh, actually uh, we did some scenario analysis, which we routinely uh, do at uh, my department to facilitate the monetary policy deliberations of the board. And uh, those scenarios suggest that an earlier exit than in mid-2017 might be feasible but would be less robust uh, as regards the sustainability of uh, the target fulfillment. Uh, in particular, if we allowed uh, the exit uh, uh, and appreciation of the currency too early, uh, with still strong uh, effects of the ongoing uh, QE by the ECB, we could, we could have a little bit too much of appreciation too early, and in the end, uh, this could push uh, inflation slightly below target again in 2018. And at the same time, the situation would uh, not allow for the increase in uh, the interest rates, which is embodied uh, in the current forecast, so we would stay at the zero lower bound for quite some time after the exit. And any downside uh, surprises uh, to inflation, which you can never anticipate, but uh, you need to take into account that uh, such uh, surprises can happen. So any such downside surprises would, could again lead to the question what kind of unconventional monetary policy uh, measure we will uh, choose to address uh, those shocks, to respond to those shocks. And this is related also to the question of Michal Skořepa. You can understand the 
two hikes uh, in interest rates in the forecast as a kind of buffer, a uh, precautionary buffer that we have in the forecast for the exit. Uh, of course, if, if uh, everything goes well, uh, we can in the end start hiking the rates if the exchange rate appreciates more than assumed or if we observe another uh, anti-inflationary shock, we would simply stay on hold for a while and to offset those shocks and then start increasing the rates uh, later on. Uh, I think the, the exit is a kind of discrete one-off policy decision, so you don't base it just by the mean forecast, but you need to take a kind of risk management uh, approach. You, you need to be really sure that uh, the exit is a robust thing and you're not going to go back. And I think we still have one question left coming from Jakub Seidler regarding what we are going to do when we see a weakening of, I mean, exchange rate. First of all, I'm very pleased that, I mean, the market has already at least recognized there is a high possibility it can happen. Why? Because, I mean, if you look at the data, I think it's quite obvious that the market, current market, is really long in, I mean, holding Czech currency and Czech corona, yeah. So, and um, Tomasz, he, he clearly stated in his presentations that we think that the, and the market is overbought. So, but we have to also say, I mean, this condition is not embedded in our forecast because our forecast is based on model forecast. And so that's why we don't, we haven't included in our forecast, but still we clearly said a lot, I mean, several bank board members, I mean, reported it before we had the monetary policy meetings that there is a high probability, there is a high risk that once we exit, from the FX commitment, the exchange rate can go in both directions, down or even, I mean, um, to depreciate as well as appreciate. So back to your questions. If we see a depreciation, we clearly said, well, we will be back in a managed flow regime. And it means, if you look at our history, it doesn't mean that there is any new floor once you do have a managed floor. Managed, I mean, managed uh, exchange rate means that you just use your currency or your FX reserves and you time to time you go to the market and you, you will see how much you can, I mean, change or influence or manage the volatility of the exchange rate. There is no certain level of, I mean, the exchange rate. Nevertheless, if it, lasts for a long time, and once we decide this long time can affect our forecast, me, I mean, meeting our inflation target, probably it's our role to act. But in this case, we have a significant power to manage it. Not with FX intervention, we can start increasing interest rates. There is no limit in increasing interest rates. So there is no limit once we see, I mean, the exchange rate can weaken. I don't want to say we will not step in the market, we can do that, but definitely I don't, personally I don't see any, any point, any discussions regarding, I mean, there is a new lower, new floor to start intervention. You know, it's managed float, yeah? And as I said, if, I mean, the bank board decides it can be a, I mean, threat for, I mean, meeting inflation target for the future, we can use interest rates. And look at our forecast, I mean, in the third quarter, in the fourth quarter, there is an assumption of 50 basis points to increase, yes, something like that. There is no limit to increase immediately, yeah. All right, I think that we have answered the first round. Do we have some more questions? Can I start the second round? Please. Martin Po, General Investments. I have a lot of technical questions. Uh, <coughs> Uh, you mentioned in the presentation the shadow interest rates. Uh, what is the spread between uh, the shadow interest rates and the current market uh, uh, interest rate? Uh, <coughs> and a related question, what's your assumption on ECB asset purchase program in 2018? 
And uh, one more question. You mentioned also that electronic <coughs> sales registration uh, have had some impact on inflation. Uh, do you have some estimates and uh, do you adjust somehow the forecast for, for these effects? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we got like two free questions. Do we have I some had, more questions? I had one Please. here on my left side. And Morning, uh, Pasquale Diana, Morgan Stanley. Can you comment perhaps on FX pass-through? It looks as though it's a very big, um, big part of the story, what happens post-exit. Um, other central banks um, managing small open economies like the Hungarian National Bank has commented that given many years of low inflation, the FX pass-through has fallen dramatically. Have you done similar work? Um, what's your current um, assumption on FX pass-through and CPI, please? Thank you. Thank you, Pascal. And the last one for the second round, please. Yeah. <coughs> Thanks for your time, first of all. Uh, Kubile Öztürk from Deutsche Bank. Pascal already asked one of my questions on exchange rate pass-through. Uh, but uh, my, my other question is whether do you have a study on the, the level of um, hedging already done by the exporters so far in terms of what will be happening to their um, actions in the FX market? And one question from the, um, uh, from the presentation, because after the exit there was a sentence saying that the monetary conditions will move from easy to uh, neutral, uh, but if you look at the uh, overall real interest rate trajectory in the forecast, it still remained negative um, for quite a long time, in fact, until the end of 2018. So how are we going, should we think about that? How is, uh, what do you mean by, you know, um, neutral monetary policy when you have still real negative interest rates? Thank okay, you. okay, thank you very much. So, well, if I look at the old questions, I mean, the second round, it seems to be more of them, they are technical, but nevertheless, I'm, I'm, I'm probably, some of them I will try to probably answer technically from more policy perspective, and Tomas, I'm going to ask later on to, to answer all the details. The first questions regarding the shadow interest rates and regarding the ECB monetary policy, I think that's definitely Tomas, he's the right person to answer, but let me provide you with some discussions we had yesterday regarding the, I mean, economic, external economic environment. This is definitely fits exactly to your questions. I think it's very interesting to look at the Czech monetary policy and we started delivering, I mean, East monetary policy for the Czech economy. It was in August 2008, more than nine years ago, yeah? And if you look at the ECB monetary policy, I mean, it's very interesting to compare it. I just want to say that even and the assumptions, I mean, of the forecast regarding the exit of FX commitment is clearly put in the mid of this year. Yeah, this is the assumption of the forecast, mid of this year. And once we, I mean, abolish this FX floor, Definitely, it's the first step to deliver less East monetary policy. It's not regarding that it's going to be tight monetary policy, and it brings me back to the last questions, you know. I'm just saying that, I mean, this economy has been benefiting from very relaxed monetary policy from August 2008. Can you imagine that? Now we have, I mean, February 2017. It's going to be the first step, very the first step. Yeah, and why I'm saying that? Because it's very interesting to compare the monetary policy de delivered by our main trade partners, I mean the Eurozone and the Czech Republic, yeah, and now, well, we are ready to probably change the cycle of the monetary policy. Of course, we have to look at what's going on in monetary policy in Eurozone, but still, we are ready to do that, the economy, and we want to see the economy can be still benefiting from our own monetary policy, depend, despite the fact that the ECB prolonged it, the um, program, and it was announced in December last year, Tomasz, it was in December, it announced it, yeah. So, and still, despite this fact, we are ready to put, as it was clearly said in the forecast, to, I mean, deliver the first step regarding the change our monetary policy in the middle of this year. 
but Thomas will answer more technical questions. Regarding the Pascal questions, exchange rate pass through, I think this is very interesting questions. And you know, we definitely, as far as I remember, and I, I, I meet you quite, I mean, at least twice a year, once we do have this meeting like this one, and this question has been repeatedly, I mean, putting on the table almost all these sessions like this one, because of course it's very important for us because before November 2013, we relied only on interest rate pass-through, and we switched mostly to exchange rate pass-through, yeah? And at that time, we, we believed that definitely it's, I mean, it's faster, it's shorter, and maybe if there is, I mean, some changes, we have to ask our technical department how it really works. And regarding the neutral monetary policy, still, if you look at the forecast, you see that both legs of monetary policy, they are put together, they are combined together, and I'm talking about the nominal interest rates as well as nominal exchange rate, yeah? And why this forecast clearly assumes that after FX, I mean, as once we, I mean, the, the, depart from a fixed commitment, you can expect gradual and slow in, uh, nominal uh, exchange rate appreciation. It's due to increase of interest rate differential. So probably that's the answer to your questions that we want to see what will happen with the exchange rate after, I mean, the, once there is an exit. Of course, there will be some volatility. We don't know exactly which way whether regarding the appreciation or depreciation. And based on this situation, we will start thinking what to do with interest rates. So definitely, it's not that in one day, we are going to switch from a really significantly loose monetary policy, I just commented it, why it was loose from August 2008, to the neutral, definitely not. We want to see what's going on with the whole market, but we still, do have in our model that the steady state of real interest rates is 1%, but it takes time to come back to this steady state. Tomas, if I can ask you to answer I mean, all those questions in more detail, thank you. Okay, <coughs> sorry, I will start with uh, the shadow rate, uh, the spread uh, from the market interest rate uh, from uh, April, when it will go down from 80 to 60 billion uh, per month, is assumed to be minus one percentage point. For the 80 billions, we had, uh, if you recall, 1.25, so it will go down to, to one percentage point, <coughs> which will last basically until the end of 2017, in line with the official announcement of the ECB. And then for 2018, we actually expect that the shadow rate or assume that the shadow rate will go back to the market rate gradually, which may accommodate some relatively fast tapering in combination with some carryover effects of the previous purchases. We don't make any kind of explicit assumption about the pace of tapering, but uh, more or less we assume that by the end of 2018, uh, the shadow rate will be close to the market rate. So if this uh, broadly answers your question. Uh, as regards the estimate of uh, the impact of electronic uh, registration of sales, uh, for in December we estimated it at uh, one to two tenths of a percentage point for headline overall inflation, which means more or less two to four tenths of a percentage point for the core inflation measure. Uh, I should add that uh, there are further rounds of EET planned for the near, near term future and those are not explicitly incorporated into the forecast. So the sectors will be different. We, we expect that in the retail sector, the impact should not be as visible as uh, in the restaurants, especially at the large uh, retail chains. Uh, you would assume that uh, most, uh, 
most uh, revenues are already part of the white economy, not, not the shadow economy, so we don't have any extra effects of EET in the forecast uh, uh, for the future. The exchange rate pass-through, <coughs> traditionally, uh, if the empirical models such as VER or vector error correction models for the Czech Republic were suggesting a pass-through of about 10%. Uh, my colleague Oksana Babetska has done some updates uh, and if I recall it well, those updates suggest the weaker pass-through uh, than, than this, oh, slightly weaker, but I would caution against making a very direct link of those empirical estimates to a kind of structural model that uh, we are using uh, in our, to prepare our forecast because in the structural model, the strength of the pass-through depends very much on uh, the source of the shock uh, or what moves the exchange rate. It's not just I see the exchange rate move and it will have an impact on prices it's important to understand uh, more deeply what, what is behind the move uh, in the exchange rate. And for example, when we introduced uh, the exchange rate commitment, we've, we still believe that uh, it had a relatively significant pass-through into prices, even though they were not uh, clearly seen with bold eye in the overall low inflation environment, but, but we believe that the pass-through was there and to some extent when we exit from the exchange rate commitment it can be symmetric, but of course in the meantime you, you have also to take into account that in the meantime a lot of the, the depreciated exchange rate actually passed into the prices, so you will not have a tendency, automatic tendency of the exchange rate to return to the pre-intervention level, but if, if there is some appreciation which is viewed by the market as relatively permanent, it could have a bigger pass-through than uh, what is on average suggested uh, by the empirical models. I'm sorry, I cannot give a more precise answer, but this is basically the situation. And the level of hedging by exporters, uh, you know that uh, we have this survey among companies which we carry out uh, together with uh, the uh, Association of Industry and Transport, but of course the data is lagging behind uh, the situation. So the last figure that we had, that we have is still for the fourth quarter uh, of last year when hedging, according to this survey, still remained below the historical average, but of course it's just around to 150, 170 firms that we survey, so I'm not sure how, how representative this is for the whole economy. Definitely at the same time what we can see is that uh, Euro-denominated uh, credit is growing in the corporate sector, so this may be a for s at least for some exporters, this may be a cheaper alternative to hedge than using the derivative market. So I would also take this as part of the hedging strategy. And then we, more or less to get more up-to-date uh, uh, information, we have to rely on uh, market intelligence uh, by our trading department. And uh, this suggests that uh, the hedging of corporate sector has increased uh, at the beginning of this year. And if I remember, the uh, Association of Exporters will, has just released uh, a statement uh, together with uh, Helena Horska suggesting that the hedging has really gone, gone up. But this is, this is a kind of anecdotic evidence rather than hard data. Well, and if I can elaborate a little bit on these questions. Well, I think that you know the data of current account, the balance of payments, you know the data of net export check economy, and definitely if you look at the data, and if you look at the data of our FX reserves, because we are transparent, we publish those data, of course there is a, some 
bike like we publish it after five, six weeks, something like that. But just if you compare this data, I think it's obvious that this market is currently overbought. I mean, the market is really long in the Czech currency. And I think it brings me back to the presentations we, we delivered to the market yesterday. That's the main reason that we clearly stated regarding the risk that the B director uncertainty is corona exchange rate developments after discontinuation of the exchange rate commitment. I think it's fair enough to say that well, once you compare those data and Tomas has said that we don't have to have I mean, all data regarding the hedging, but the more Czech exporters are hedged, the more volume is hedged, and if it's hedged in longer, I mean, horizon, so there is a really, I mean, high risk that once the FX commitment is abolished, that the corona can go in both directions. And it brings me back to the question which was, I mean, uh, raised by Mr. Seidler, yeah, that definitely the market has to be prepared I mean, for, I mean, the exchange rate pass in, in both directions, yeah? But that's fair enough. I mean, there's a managed fault, and we do have tools how to, I mean, com combine those conditions to definitely steer the forecast back to the inflation target in next 10, or I mean, 12, 18 months, because we will be ready to use our interest rates to use conventional monetary policy. This is what I wanted to add regarding the exporters hedging and the, the market regarding the overbought of Czech Corona. So we answer all questions, I think, yeah, regarding the second round. Maybe start the third one, and maybe the last round. Helena, first, lady first. Hello, good morning. Helena Horska from Raiffeisen. Uh, yesterday, Mr. Jiří Rusnok, our governor, mentioned in a press conference that the CNB is ready to use all available measures to manage the excessive uh, coronas movement. My question is, what does it mean? It means that not only intervention is possible to use, but you are thinking out of the box and you are thinking about maybe not only the change in interest rates, but also the real uh, rules of uh, repo operations or the rules for overnight deposits in the case of excessive currency movement. Thank you. Thank you for the questions. So the second one, please. Hey, um, Gabor Ambrush from uh, NatWest Markets, uh, the investment banking arm of the Royal Bank of Scotland. Uh, I have a question regarding um, policy sequencing. So the Fed, has, Fed gave us a sequencing that you know, they bought uh, via QE a lot of government bonds and you know, they cut rates. Um, they said they will first increase rates and at a later stage in the future they will unwind their government bond holding. Um, do you see your apex reserves in any way similarly that they can see their government debt holding? Do you see that you would want at some moment in the future uh, unwind your FX holdings gradually as a monetary policy tool to tighten monetary policy in order to complement uh, policy tightening? Or, and, and if so, do you see any sequencing uh, to be necessary? Or you prefer first when it comes to tightening just to deliver conventional tightening and um, via interest rate increases and you consider your reserves, they are sitting where they are, and they will not, unless we really have to manage the exchange rate, be become a policy tool that will need to be unwound in the future. Uh, I don't know whether it's, my question is clear enough. About the sequencing, yeah, definitely, yeah. And the third one, the last one? You on the left side was one. Marek uh, Dřímal, Komerční Banka. Helena was faster, but I have a slightly different question. Um, I find it surprising that uh, the board didn't discuss negative rates yesterday as per the statement that was released, contrary to what was uh, mentioned in December statement. So what changed between December and the 2nd of May that the board didn't, so, or didn't see the need to discuss negative rates? Thank you. Okay, so we got like three questions and maybe the first one and the third one, they are going together. So let me come back to the first one regarding that 
our governor, he mentioned that probably we would use all available tools regarding to face volatility, whatever. I think that it's definitely, it's even stated in our bank board statement. It's, I think it's the last sentence, isn't it? It's the last sentence. And yes, you are right. I mean, it's a, there is a little bit change. The last I mean, sentence was changed. If you compare it with the previous statements, it's very easy. Why? Why it was, I mean, changed? The bank board had discussions regarding this change. Why? And I think I have already described it because probably the market had an idea that we really would have to intervene, or intervene if we see the volatility is really high. It brings me back again to the question posed by me, uh, Mr. Seidler. Does this mean, I, I think this is not the case that we have to limit ourselves only to use intervention again. If I see there is a sudden huge depreciation, of course I can step in and use intervention to really mitigate the volatility. But if it, I mean, the exchange rate goes in a depreciation way, I can start using, using interest rates. And that's the case, and I'm here to, clar I mean, to really clarify the change, because in the previous statement, it was the, the, uh, the wording only a fixed interventions, yeah? And yesterday, we published not intervention, but all tools, something like that was the, 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 the sentence. So it's not only about the interventions. We can also start using interest rates to probably deliver the ideal combination of nominal exchange rate and nominal interest rates to serve, I mean, as a monetary policy for this economy, yeah? But still, do we have to limit ourselves only for nominal interest rates and nominal exchange rate? And that was your question, whether we think about some other tools. Let me be very honest, you know, so far, I mean, it's really premature because the commitment is until the end of this quarter. But there is one thing, and it's again about the, not history, but about our memories. As far as I remember, before we started FX intervention in November 2014, the whole year before that, we also used some other tools. And just, I mean, some of you, I mean, listen to this tool. It was verbal intervention, yeah? So there are some other tools we can use, not only, I mean, a real intervention, not only nominal interest rates, maybe verbal intervention, etc. So don't limit yourself only on some conventional monetary policy tools. It brings me back to the nominal interest rates, yeah. Uh, regarding nominal interest rates, well, and Helena, he stated that we have never ever ruled out to use anything, including nominal interest rates. Yeah, there was no discussions yesterday. We are, I mean, transparent. Yeah, I can confirm that. But it doesn't mean if we see it's necessary, we are ready to use all available tools, including nominal interest rates. But it brings me back to some other statements provided by our bank board members before the monetary policy meetings. On one hand, I said, I mean, after more than eight years, almost nine years, delivering of really a relaxed monetary policy for this economy, probably it's time to think about delivering less relaxed, not tight, but less relaxed. And if I start using nominal inter uh, negative interest rates, well, it goes vice versa. It doesn't make a sense, you know? So if we have to use it, I have to, it means that if we want to penalize some, somebody something, it goes I mean, in contradiction with the monetary policy I want to deliver for this market. Yeah, that's the explanation, yeah. All right, so, and still we, we have the second questions. I haven't, I haven't answered. I got the, I mean, I got the feeling from the question, it's about the sequencing. And it brings me back to the I mean, combination of exiting a fixed floor and nominal interest rates. You know, our model is based on uncovered interest rate parity. And of course, if I want to, I mean, exit from FX commitment, yeah, it doesn't make a sense to start before that increasing interest rates because based on the in interest rate differential, it would attract more inflow of the capital. 
So, well, I think, and we have already transparently communicated to the market that it seems to us, based on the economic theory, as well as on the real financial market, I mean, common behavior that first we should exit FX floor, and after that we should start, I mean, using nominal interest rates. That's the, our sequencing. Regarding the more detailed sequencing, whether we should think about some other internal floor, something like that, it probably it poses a philosophical question because if I'm speaking about exiting of FX floor, it seems to me it doesn't make a sense to introduce another, even internal floors, yeah? So back what we had regarding FX regimes before we introduced FX commitment, it was managed flow, and managed flow was based that our monetary uh, monetary department, not I mean the monetary policy department, but the in department which is responsible for banking for operations in the market, market operations, you know, he uses, this department uses a certain amount of check corona or of FX reserves and time to time intervene in the market. Try to, I would say, manage to steer volatility. It's not about new FX floors. Even internal, there is no but still, this is based on the experience these institutions had before November 2013. This is based on, I mean, economic theory that if we don't want, if we want to deliver managed flow, there shouldn't be an internal FX floor. But the exact way how to exit has to be discussed in next weeks. Yeah. So, but general, I mean, answer regarding your sequencing is that. First, we should exit, and after that, we should think about nominal interest rates. And regarding sequencing, I personally don't think any, I mean, what did it you to think about new internal exits? And I think that Tomas, he wanted to add some, some, some probably things, and you also want to follow up on this question. Yeah, my understanding of this uh, sequencing question was such that you are also asking if there is any plan to offload the FX reserves uh, in the future, like uh, the discussion now at the Fed, whether they, they should start to offload the holdings of uh, government bonds. And uh, for the moment, there is no such uh, discussion. We, we don't have any mental problem at this institution with uh, large balance sheet size, which is also partly related to the fact that even before the crisis, we were living in a system with uh, surplus liquidity in the banking sector, and we know that this is no problem in any way for monetary policy implementation or for the ability of the central bank to achieve uh, price stability. It is true that uh, before uh, we entered uh, the, uh, the FX commitment, we used to have uh, a program of selling earnings on FX reserves, which more or less was capping the nominal volume of reserves, and as the economy grew, the relative size relative to the GDP was shrinking but this was actually never regarded as a monetary policy measure. This was uh, regarded as a kind of balance sheet uh, measure over the long term, which is done in a way to affect uh, monetary conditions to the least possible way. So, and, but, but this program is suspending, uh, suspended uh, since 2012 and there is no discussion whatsoever at least for the moment to, to resume it uh, in a foreseeable future so I, I can confirm what uh, Mr. Uh, Vice Governor said we, we will definitely first exit from the exchange rate commitment we may use some FX interventions to moderate swings uh, in the uh, in the exchange rate and uh, once the 
once we see that the situation has stabilized in the FX market, we'll see how much of the neutralization of uh, monetary conditions has been delivered via the exchange rate. We can then start uh, gradually hiking the nominal interest rates, but there is no discussion for the moment about any kind of balance sheet measures uh, for the future. You wanted, you wanted to follow up or not? I think that was the answer yeah, yeah. mainly to my question. And, but so, but if, I, yeah, if I can follow up, I mean, that, I mean, that's a pretty interesting discussion regarding the if there is any limits of our balance sheets. Obviously, there is no limit. You know, I mean, FX reserves, it's something, it's our investment. And it makes money for us. These are obvious, you know. And we, the, the higher, I mean, FX inter reserves we, we do have, we can even, I mean, prolong our investment horizon. And based on e, the yield curve, you know, the longer horizon you invest, the more money you can make. So I'm just saying that because definitely, and you are economists, so you know that, that there is no limit regarding the fixed reserves, and you know there is no limit where we can invest. If there is any discussions regarding, I mean, where to invest, it's all those limits regarding the assets class. They are our internal limits, our internal limits. And we can always increase it, we can always introduce new asset classes. And it's very easy just to compare what, for example, ECB buys. Yeah? And, and we are very transparent, we publish our annual reports, you know our criteria where we invest, you know where we invest, and we, I mean, as the other central banks, you know, we also invest in equities, in, and I should be more precise, we said in indexes of equities, and it's our internal decisions that we invest 10% of our FX reserves in equities. It's again our internal, I mean, procedure. Okay, let me start, I mean, the, the last round of questions if we do have. If don't, we can go for lunch. <laughs> Michal, you already? Yeah, yeah, there is a follow-up. Yeah. Thank you, I just would like um, one follow-up question. Your managed uh, commitment, is that symmetric? So are you symmetrically managing the float after exit, or is that one-sided? Look, I mean, we do have inflation target. We do have a tolerance band, which is symmetric. So the answer to your questions should be that we should be symmetric regarding the risks, yeah? But it's very difficult to answer these questions on behalf of the whole bank board. There are seven members, and we haven't this discussion yesterday regarding the symmetric issues, yeah? But Tomás, he wants to add something. I would add, there is a natural kind of asymmetry imposed by the zero lower bound, which was already a part of answers to previous questions. If we have more appreciation of exchange rate and uh, what is uh, consistent with uh, sustainable achievement of our inflation target, given that rates are still at zero, the available tool is basically just FX interventions and, and of course some communication, things like that. But on the upside, we have both interventions and the interest rate. So th this is a kind of natural isometry uh, imposed by the presence of the zero lower bound. But, yeah. Yeah, but, but regarding mean the assessment of the risk, you know, they are symmetric. I want to say that, of course, we try to put together what's going on with nominal exchange rate and what's going on with nominal interest rate. We put it together as a monetary condition index, and this is, I mean, the symmetric approach regarding the inflation target. That's why we have symmetric, I would say, tolerance bands of our inflation target. Let me start the, the last, I think it's already fourth, fourth round, and Michal, Michal, he was the first one. Uh, there was a lot of talk to edit today about uh, the immediate future, but I thought it might be useful to hear a few words about uh, the more fundamental issues. And more specifically, I was wondering about your assessment of uh, the labor market, because as, as I looked at the picture, uh, the forecast for unemployment is that it should stay where it is or even fall a little bit lower for the next two years. Now, uh, my impression is that already now we are quite some way below what uh, the CNB's assessment of the natural rate of unemployment is currently. And on the other hand, the, the forecast for wages, for nominal wages, uh, all right, it goes up about 5%, but then it eases a little bit later on. So my question is, what's your current assessment of Nairu, and if, uh, 
if these numbers together really make 100% sense. Because I would expect, if, if you expect the, the unemployment to be so low for such a long time, we might expect maybe even, even stronger uh, wage growth. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, do we have some more questions? Pascal again. Pascal. Hi again. Um, we've commented a lot on the, on the exit. Can you clarify, in terms of financial stability, to the extent that a lot of these um, long positions are parked in local bonds, are you worried about uh, spiking yields as all these um, investments seek for, to exit at some point? And um, have, you, have you thought about, you know, buyers of last resort locally, would you ever consider intervening in the bond market? Thank you for your questions. And the last one for this meeting, do we have? Yeah, Jaromir. Uh, Jaromir Shintela City. I have a question of Vice Governor Tomšík. Uh, you mentioned that current inflation is not a problem if it's even above 2%, but if it is within the tolerance band, you mentioned in some interview. Uh, but if we have, for example, some negative supply shock, uh, to commodities and commodities prices are much higher and inflation is going to, let's say, in your outlook to be above 3%, what are the implications for the FX floor commitment? Thank you. Okay, so let me start with the first questions regarding I mean, the fundamental issues, what's going on in the labor market. First of all, and I'm, I'm personally very pleased that the current rate of unemployment in the Czech economy is the lowest one in the whole EU market, yeah? And of course, I mean, it raises a question, what, what is the NATO? Are we below the NATO or not? And probably, Tomáš, he will elaborate on that a little bit more, but what was really discussed yesterday, it, it is as follows, that definitely we see there is probably no more room for further, I mean, decrease in unemployment rate, yeah? And that's why definitely our forecast of the wage growth is really based on these assumptions, and that's why we really see quite high wage forecast, about 5%. But I understand your questions, whether it's still in line. If I put together, and you are, if I understand correctly, only 5%, comparing very low unemployment rate. On the other hand, is it really very low 5% growth in wages? Look at the inflation forecast, you see? So if you mean the composite, I mean, for, for inflation and for, I mean, the real growth in wages is definitely, well, this economy hasn't, I mean, seen the forecast, the growth in wages around 5% for several years, yeah? So I, I still, believe that, of course, it can be 5.1, 5.3, 4.9. We, we can discuss about the I mean, detailed figures, but still it's in line. The whole economic story makes sense. A very low unemployment rate. That's why we do have extraordinary high growth for wages. So it, it makes sense for the bank board. Maybe Tomasz will answer in more details. Regarding the second question, Regarding financial stability and regarding, I mean, the bond market, let me, let me start with the financial stability. You put these questions together, but honestly, I'm here just to report what kind of discussion we had yesterday. And the bank board had quite long discussions regarding the financial stability, but not regarding the bond market, yeah? <coughs> regarding the financial stability, and I'm, I'm, I think that I can say that I'm very pleased, I mean, this institution is responsible for both, for financial stability as well as for price stability. Because, of course, based on the business cycle, based on the financial cycle, mean that it doesn't mean that those, both those cycles, they have to go together in the same line for a long time. We had a period, they were in line. Now, and we see that, the financial cycle, we see a really significant growth in, I mean, loans in mortgages. And it makes sense because, you know, that we do have very low nominal interest rates. One of you asked me regarding the real interest rates. We are still below our, I mean, long run steady state. But regarding the financial stability, and it was clearly stated yesterday by the bank board, 
we are here to use the different tools to tackle financial stability. And you know, these institutions has never ever hesitated regarding using those tools. When we are using like conservative buffers, we are using like domestic systematically important bank buffers, we are using counter cyclical buffers, we are ready to use, I mean, some recommendations regarding loan to value, regarding the debt stability issue. So regarding the financial stability, we know this issue and we have discussed it and we are here to use all tools to deliver financial stability. But your question was more related to bond market. Honestly, there was no discussion yesterday regarding the bond market. And we are here, I mean, to use our, our conventional monetary policy tools to deliver price stability and financial stability. Yeah. And I think I said it in some interviews, if someone wants to really jump in in the Czech bond markets, feel free. But once you're exiting the bond markets, you have to be aware of the current economic environment. You have to be aware that the market is shallow. Yeah? It's your decision. The final questions are regarding the current inflation and that some of us, we tolerate that current inflation is or can be in next few months or quarters above inflation target, but it's still in tolerance bands. Well, of course, personally, I would be very pleased if I saw inflation always in, I mean, I would say inflation target and especially in the tolerance bands, yeah? But I have to probably, we have to distinguish, I mean, two things. The first one, that and uh, is that if there is a inflation current inflation reported, it's inflation which is measured year on year. It's a really old figure. I can't do anything to change it. I can't do anything to influence it. I just take it as a part of information. I just I mean I just put it in model in a future thing, but I have to live with this statement that I can't do anything to change it. Yeah. So that's why I have to look whether this current inflation is something as a part of the long term or whether it's something as a one-off effect. And this was very heavily discussed yesterday that the current inflation, the inflation we saw in the December last year, the high inflation is really based on one of effects. And all of them, they were mentioned by Tomasz, I'm just going to repeat them. The first one is that definitely there is a quite jump in food prices. Yeah? And after year on year basis, it will uh, fade away. And again, we saw uh, definitely stop declining prices in full prices. And there was an increase in full prices. And finally, and we have to take into account, there were changes in value added tax as well as in um, electronic registration system. So all those factors, I, I personally believe they are one off and they will evaporate in 12 months. That's why we are really very much focused on core inflation and let me come back to the history. You know that there was a long period in this economy we had negative core inflation. It was really in deflation. And after using all monetary policy tools, we change the long-term, I mean depreciation, I mean long-term deflation, and now the peak, what we expect regarding core inflation, and it was reported by Tomas, it's two point three at the end of this year. Yeah. That's why let's try to filter information what is one off and what is really something as a piece of long term. Yeah. Tomas, may I ask you regarding the, the bond market, regarding the financial stability, what's the opinion of our I mean, experts regarding mm -hmm. bond market? Well as regards the bond market, I think you are pointing to a very important uh, thing that uh, invest for foreign investors which are uh, like expecting some gains after the exit 
may actually find it difficult to offload the positions, not just in the FX market, but also in the government bond market. So they may need to go through two overbought shallow markets to cash out the profit. And the first one may be the, the government bond market. We all know that uh, the share of foreign investors in the Czech government bond market has increased above 30%. So there is quite a significant participation of foreigners, but of course from, from our side we have uh, no intention, I would say, to make, them easy, make it easier for them to take out the profit. <laughs> I just clearly said there was no discussion, so you see, well, we don't we, take it I mean, as a really big point. <coughs> yeah, it's it's we, their, their, their business. We, we don't provide any kind of green spends put by signaling that we would be ready to intervene in the government bond market. Uh, I, I don't think so. Um, and uh, about the labor market situation, I would agree with uh, the assessment of uh, Michal Skorepa in the sense that we also assess the labor market situation as relatively tight. Our estimate of Nairu is around 4%, of course, with some margin of uncertainty, so we are getting somewhat below it. Uh, that's also why, uh, together with, uh, with the slight overshoot of the inflation target, that's why our inf nominal wage forecast goes above the 5% uh, assumed uh, long run or steady state uh, growth rate. But you are right, then in 2018 it, it returns back to 5% because we, we believe that uh, if there is some appreciation of the currency after the exit, which is part of the forecast, of course there is uncertainty, but in the forecast there is appreciation, especially for the exporting sector, uh, this will create some pressure on moderate wages, uh, on moderate wage developments, because it will uh, be a factor reducing the price competitiveness uh, of exporters, so they could not allow at the same time to have really fast nominal wage growth. This, so there is some pass-through of the, the appreciating exchange rate, not just to prices, but also to, to wage growth. Uh, this, is, this is part of the story, I would say. Yeah, I think it's, oh, you can see it's 32 minutes past midday. I'm very pleased that you have come for discussions. Thank you very much for your questions. And see you next time, probably. Yeah, thank you very much. I would like really thank to Vice Governor, to Tomáš Holub for his heroic stay today and for your attention and uh, I wish you a pleasant rest of the day, nice weekend and we will see uh, during the May on the second meeting. Thank you very much for your attention and goodbye. Thank you.